This is Chaplain Rosamond. I am legally licensed and ordained by Chaplain Fellowship Ministries. A certain place is what I have chosen to name my ministry. It is not a registered, non-for-profit organization. I choose to be more freelance. I have all the rights of a legally licensed pastor in all 50 United States. If I choose to, or if the Lord ever directs me to, I could open up my own church. This presentation is based on Scripture. Now, Jesus said, as often as you do, you know, break the bread, share the bread and the wine, do this in remembrance of me. Often, as often as you do means you, you could have communion and remember the Lord's death and sufferings daily if you want, weekly. However, mainstream Christian churches have a monthly communion service. And anyone can conduct a communion service, not just a priest or a pastor. I desire to dig a little deeper to aid in your healing, your miracles, and to deepen your respect for what Jesus did for you. I have entitled this, Not Your Typical Death in Those Days, and here's why in the order of Jesus' sufferings according to the Gospels. For sure, in his day and age, criminals were crucified, but his was much different, and here's why. Let's start in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus suffered severe mental and emotional agony, having felt, imagined, and ruminated, being separated from his Father, having been with him since eternity past, also feeling, imagining, and ruminating every human being's mental and emotional pains derived from their past, presents, and futures, including all who have already died and all who will be born and will die, agonies from their deaths of families, pets, wars, poverty, hunger, fear, whether real or imagined, theft, betrayals, kidnappings, accidents, and from every one of the Ten Commandments that were broken, which everyone on the planet broke, breaking one commandment breaks the entire law. Having an angel come to him to strengthen him, only to use that strength to pray more intensely. Developing hematohydrosis, with the blood dripping to the ground, caused by all of his extreme mental, emotional, and physical stress of being separated from his father, feeling abandoned, yet constantly praying, and having agreed to fulfill his father's will. He did not let the cup that he was to drink of pass him by. Historically, a cupbearer was a high-ranking official in charge of serving the king. It was primarily the responsibility of the cupbearer to serve the wine to the royal table. Since kings were concerned about plots to poison them, cupbearers had to guard the cup carefully and would sometimes taste the drink before serving it to ensure it was safe. Due to the responsibilities of this position, a cupbearer had to be trustworthy and loyal. A cupbearer had the king's confidence and because of his character was able to exert influence in the royal court. We know of the cupbearer that Pharaoh put into prison was restored to his position. What does that mean for you today? Because Jesus drank from the poisoned cup, you can be restored today. The scriptures mention that King Solomon had cupbearers. Nehemiah was a cupbearer to the Persian king. Next, Jesus is betrayed into the hands of sinners with a kiss from someone who knew him well in their most private location. As the betrayer led a crowd of people to Jesus, all his close friends lose faith in him. Then he is arrested after being tied up. Next, Jesus is put on trial at night in secret as liars give false testimony and as false evidence was presented having his face spit on by all who were in assembly, while also pounding him with their fists and antagonizing him to prophesize who hit him. Next, an entire battalion of the governor's soldiers stripped off all of his clothes. Now, we don't show that in Bible movies, you know, a totally naked man, but he was totally naked. This was to shame him. They put on him the scarlet robe to mock him as they all spit on him. They used sticks to beat him on his head that was covered with a bag and he was blindfolded. Have you ever been sucker punched or have you ever sucker punched somebody else? Look, the sufferings of Jesus is not just parallels that what you have suffered, but it's also about what you have done to others. 
Please meditate on each injury, each affliction, mental, physical, that Jesus suffered and search your heart. How have you done that to others? They ridiculed him over and over again. All the guards beat him too. Next, thorn branches were woven together into a mock crown, and they saluted him in mockery. Hail to the king of the Jews, kneeling in front of him in mock worship and forcing the thorns into his head. Now, if that's not enough to kill anybody, I don't know what would. But you see, Jesus says, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down freely. He literally could not physically die until he said so. So what was he waiting for? How did he know the appropriate time to die? When all was accomplished, the redemption of everybody and all of God's creation and all righteousness needed to be fulfilled. Next, they put him in chains after all the beatings to hand him over to Pilate. Then he had his beard plucked out. The entire beard is plucked out. Isaiah 50 verse 6. I offered my back to those who struck me, my cheeks to those who plucked out my beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. He then was flogged severely in hopes to release him by satisfying the crowds, insisting on his death on the execution stake. Imagine a man's face, a man who's got a full beard, and they pluck out, rip out, hairs, one hair, single hairs, patches of hairs. That face, that skin would be torn, broken, bloody. Now listen to this in Isaiah 53, starting with verse 2. He was without form and not especially handsome. We saw him, but his appearance did not attract us. People despised and avoided him, a man of pain, well acquainted with illness, like someone from whom people turn their faces. He was despised. We did not value him. In fact, it was our diseases he bore, our pains from which he suffered. Yet we regarded him as punished, stricken, and afflicted by God. But he was wounded because of our crimes, crushed because of our sins. The disciplining that makes us whole fell on him, and by his bruises we are healed. Adonai laid on him the guilt of all of us. I'm at verse 7 now. Though mistreated... He was submissive, he did not open his mouth, like a lamb led to the slaughter. After force arrest and sentencing, he was taken away, and none of his generation protested his being cut off from the land of the living for the crimes of my people. Verse 9, although he had done no violence and had said nothing deceptive, yet it pleased Adonai to crush him with illness to see if he would present himself as a guilt offering. My righteous servant makes many righteous, for it is their sins that he suffers. Verse 12, while actually bearing the sin of many and interceding for the offenders. Now listen to this. What prompted me to make this is I am in remembrance many years ago of actually um, a messianic um, Jew who said that when Jesus walked the earth, he wasn't handsome and wasn't really attractive looking. And I disagreed because Jesus would have had perfect form. He was made from the seed of man, but conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. He would have been perfect, perfectly symmetrical, perfect in face. Um, genetically perfect. And he had to be perfect anyways because he had to be the perfect lamb. He had to have no flaw whatsoever, no physical flaws. I believe Jesus being without form is because of all the beatings. He was pulverized. He probably looked like a blob hanging on the cross. It's not the pretty picture we see with Jesus on the cross with some blood on him. He would have lost his silhouette. And losing form, could it be? You see, we were formed in the image of God. And yet Jesus was without form. 
What would giving up his form equate to with our receiving or being redeemed of our own form? Considering that mankind was lost at the fall, they have no identity in Christ. Sure, they were formed in the image of God, yet they are without God. They cannot continue on to be molded and formed into the image of Christ. Then above his head on his cross, the charges against him were nailed. All right, now, I want to interject something. Why are beards important in Jewish culture? The practice derives from Leviticus 19, verse 27 in the Torah, which states, You shall not round off the corners of your head or destroy the corners of your beard. According to the 12th century scholar, Maimonides, I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly, this prohibition was a way to differentiate Jews from idolatrous priests who shave their beards. Again, having been so badly beaten that he lost his human form, a face with a plucked out beard, think of the most grotesque picture of Jesus on the cross. Now I challenge you to correlate all the possible illnesses, diseases, abnormalities, mental and emotional and physical sufferings, crimes people commit from the mildest to the most grotesque, murders, rapes, insults, loss of jobs, loss of homes, lands, equated all to Jesus' sufferings. He suffered for you. He took your place. We are told to take up our cross and follow Jesus. Die daily to your sinful nature, to your sinful flesh. Jesus also suffered rebellions. Now, what do I mean by that? A rebellion is a violent uprising against, let's say, a government that is usually intended to change the government or its policies. Rebellions are often caused by political, religious, or social grievances and can be historically important events that mm, reconstruct a social or political order, not necessarily meaning it's a good thing. In the Gospel of John 19, verse 15, But they shouted, Take him away! Take him away! Crucify him! Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar. So what am I implying? Look, governments will never be totally stable or secure. There's always ups and downs. Jesus suffered rebellions. Why? Because he is going to return and establish his kingdom, his throne on earth. He is king of kings and lord of lords. He understands and empathizes with rebellions against Governments, countries, communities, neighborhoods, towns, families, businesses, even churches. And so before Jesus actually dies on the cross by giving up his spirit unto the Father, he says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. What do you mean they don't know what they were doing? They know full well what they were doing. Ah, but you know what? They didn't know what they were doing. They did not understand who they were crucifying. They did not fully comprehend why. And when you accept Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, he will enlighten you. You will come to the full knowledge of what he accomplished on the cross and why. And he wants you to be saved today. Receive him as your Savior. Now, it's not just the revelation and the truth of knowing that Jesus suffered and died on a cross. That's historic fact. Everybody knows that. It's the revelation that he was raised from the dead that makes one born again. And only the Father in heaven, by the power of the Holy Spirit, can give an individual that revelation that Jesus is alive. To those of you who don't know Jesus yet personally as your Savior, spend some time, read the scriptures if you have a Bible in your home, listen to this video again, talk to God, ask Him to reveal Jesus to you. The Holy Spirit will put in your heart words of repentance. He will bring to mind the things you need to repent of. He will reveal to you that you are a lost person, a lost sinner in need of salvation. And it is by grace that we are saved, not of works, lest any man should boast. And may you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and be baptized in water. And those 
who have been forgiven much, love much. Receive all the forgiveness Jesus has for you. He said on the cross, Father, forgive them. God will not deny Jesus anything because he was obedient unto death. He will forgive you. In turn, you must forgive others. At times, it can be very difficult to forgive. And some things take a long time to forgive. And some things we don't want to forgive. But that is not what Jesus commands us to do. And forgiveness is in present tense. Typically, when we think of forgiving someone, it's something that happened in the past. But Jesus forgave in the present tense while it was happening to him. He forgave. If we don't forgive others, our Father cannot forgive us. Can forgiveness take time? What do I mean by that? Sometimes you have to go before the Lord and talk to Him, explain to Him how you're feeling about what happened or what's going on, and then forgive each incident, forgive each person. Sometimes it's not just a simple, yeah, I forgive you, and sometimes it is, and it's just, it's just washed away. Let's pray. Father, give us all grace to comprehend everything that was accomplished on the cross, everything that Jesus did for us. Save us, Lord. Help us to carry our own crosses and to die daily to our flesh. And Lord, help us to forgive those who have offended us. Our Father, which art in heaven, O hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, just as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us all of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Yours is the kingdom, Lord, and the glory and the power, both now and forever. Amen. Good news was just a story, but that 